in this view of Abbot Suget holding up a stained glass window, I'm really amused at the way the figures are presented in here. They look sort of like a Venus of Willendorf. So extraordinarily buxom ladies. Not what you would find in a Roman Catholic church, I think. It's 1.30, Maggie. Thank you. See, I have you so trained, don't I? <laughs> uh, and there is more that um, I would like to share as we're dealing with these ideal cities as um, becoming concrete marble objects on earth in the form of um, Gothic cathedrals uh, to which we owe this enormous cultural debt to Abbot Suget, who seems to have had a kind of an unusual high degree of receptivity to the visual arts, um, to be really moved by them. So he had the sense that through stirring, especially light-filled, overwhelming visual impressions, uh, sensory impressions, uh, a worshiper would um, be brought into greater contact with the divine. You just have that sense of moving outside yourself. And For him, it was more than light. Um, oh, no, this one was it. More than color, more than the materials, it was light. And of course, that's uh, such an ancient uh, analogy to the divine. I mean, think of ancient Egypt and their, and their belief in, in a sun god, because light is the one physical perception that doesn't call on any other, no weight, no touch, no odor. So it's as immaterial as is possible. And to create a church that brought you that sense of light, not necessarily bright sunlight, but just light and in his sake, it'll be colored light. Um, he, called together builders, we don't know who or from where, uh, who chose to use pointed arches that had been experimented with in, in some Romanesque churches and also stained glass, which also had been used elsewhere, but never brought into this kind of thoroughgoing symphony as it is in the church at Saint-Denis, or then we'll look just for a little while at the church at Chartres. So, oh my goodness, I know what I have to do. Here, we'll go to that image. I, I was also thinking, well, what difference does it make if the churches were vaulted in the first place? There was one very practical thing having nothing to do with its being a heaven on earth. And that was a stone vaulted building was less prone to um, destruction by fire. Uh, and that would have been a very persuasive reason to, to work with a stone ceiling. So here we have, again, the church at San Denis, the first Gothic church, not all of it done during Sujay's lifetime, but this Western end and just down beyond what we can see over there. And that's the image we, uh, was the last, last time where you could see the light shining in, in the stained glass. Now, all the stained glass also 
contained religious imagery. They were the stories of the Bible, which in earlier wooden ceiling churches, say even early Christian churches in Rome, um, were, were often shown through mosaics. And another form that had some, if there were gold backgrounds, they were light reflecting. But um, so that the church becomes almost like a, an encyclopedia of the faith. All the major biblical events, the major saints um, are can be present and, and you're there in their midst. So this is where we stopped last time uh, <clears throat> with the virtues of using a pointed arch, which that you could get however the shape of the space underneath you could get a ceiling that rose to a uniform height by just changing the level of the spanning arches. Whereas with a, over a square, say you used a round arch, the diagonal would be so much greater that the arch in the center would raise, be raised much higher. So we talked about that. And then the other feature that was so extremely important was this system of buttressing. Rather than thickening the walls to carry the weight of the ceiling, it's essentially deferred by what is often, there's an analogy that these cathedrals are like skeletons and that these would be like the fingers reaching over and touching the wall at just the junctures where all the weight comes and they carry it out, out beyond the church which means that all the space in between can be open for windows. And since there's here, you don't need to have a heavy ceiling. You can open it up sometimes to have a little bit of a gallery here. Um, and so sometimes if there's a crowd as there might be on a saint's feast day or on any major festival, there could also be additional people up there. So this then is the skeletal like diagrammatic image of a typical, especially French Gothic church. And uh, why do I show you a plan of it? I mean, why, why is that significant? Well, it is. The, the parts that are in black are the parts from Suger's time. All crossed lines are indicating what's going on at the ceiling level. But look at the width of the walls. Not much. Interior support, near toothpicks. This building truly cannot weigh much because it's being pushed outside the structure. And when you're within, you don't see anything that's going to give you that clue that this is a heavy structure on the outside. And here's another one of Suger's uh, windows. Here he is um, at the feet of the Virgin Mary as he offers the church to her. We're certainly not going to spend any time with a sculpture from this church, but I thought you would probably would want to know that in the Met, we have a piece of Suger's church, this figure who probably was in the uh, courtyard of the cloister alongside the church where the monks would wander. So sh this one is in the Met. And there's the face, it's an Old Testament king. And also the Walters in Baltimore has a head that was from the facade. So there is, and uh, Washington DC has another piece that was owned by Sujeb, uh, Great Cup. So some of his groundbreaking creations or creations made for him have made it to the shores here. What time period is this? This is the Gothic age. So this is the 12th and 13th centuries. 
Now, I want to show you three slides that are like a break, but another way in which I was thinking about, hmm, When you go into a Gothic church, you cannot help but be overwhelmed by the size, the soaring ceilings, the slightly dimmed light. It's an awesome experience. But there are things that I think we'd probably inured to because we know you go to a mall, there's an atrium, there's a high center space. Um, we live in a world of structures that have um, steel frames so that the buildings, the walls are just skins on the steel frame. But we have to think that this is all in stone and that most people, most of the time, lived in very small, cramped housing. So the only large space they would know was the cathedral. And the cathedral was used not just for worship, but say it's the day of the weekly market, and it's uh, pouring red cats and dogs. They hold the market inside. Any trade fairs, they hold them inside the church. So it becomes, a, uh, it has a, well, the church en encompassed all of life. So it had all these secular uses as well. So only a little bit about how they built them. At the, in the Middle Ages, there still was no such thing as a professional architect. Guilds, guaranteed the, a level of training and tradition for say stone workers or almost any other craft. And then there would be someone with some experience in the craft who would be called upon to supervise the work. Not only was there no architect, but there were no such things as far as we know as architectural drawings. So how did they do it? Well, it was built on proportions. Um, there was a sense that, and I'll show you a slide later on where you, can, you see this, that the whole of the universe is built on a system of geometric and numerical proportions, that God is the great geometer. And to make anything stable, healthy, secure, it needs to follow a system of proportions. And if the builders know, or oh, this section is to be two times the length of this, or if we build an equilateral triangle, that's to cover the ground plan of this, or this is a, a square, and then this is a multiple or a, a, a divisor of that. They, they just needed to know the, essentially the scheme, the numerical scheme, and then they would be able to build. So you have people at work here building with their quite simple tools. If anyone is uh, up at the um, Cathedral of St. John the Divine for many, many years, when work was continuing on the construction of the facade, you would see people there still learning these um, craft skills. Then here's the cathedral under construction at the back. And this manuscript is a very helpful one for that. You see menial laborers carrying the blocks. They have to carry them up the ladder as they build. This is building a Tower of Babel, but it's being treated like a Gothic cathedral. And for a crane to get anything up, it was human powered, just like we might the gerbil on the wheel. So it was extremely dangerous. Should the rope break, of course, this is going to spin backward. That's the minimum broken limbs. And this crashes to the ground, not only destroying the stone, but anybody who's underneath it. So this is all very hazardous, extraordinary laborious work. And this is um, a reconstruction of some of the tools that would have been used. So this would be one of those wheels that was used within to sort of get the stones up toward the ceiling, build the walls high.
And then for a marvelous illustration of the way all people, not just clerics or theologians or scholars, understood the nature of the universe and that the physical world is simply a, a reflection of the reality, which is the, the sublime, eternal, beyond this world reality. Well, I'll just uh, quickly take you through a little bit about the history of Shark Cathedral. I, I do like this. There's a procession that will wend its way to the church, which was very common. This church is dedicated to the Virgin Mary. It's on a site that had been hallowed for centuries because it was thought that the tunic that Mary wore when she gave birth to the Christ child was kept here. So it had an extraordinary relic. And people would come to uh, honor the relic. And there were also several trade fairs, especially with the cloth guild here. So it, it, it drew great crowds from far away. Well, I'll tell you a little more about its history before we look at that. So there had been a Romanesque church here of exactly that same dimension on the ground, not the same height, built in the Romanesque style. Oh, this was extraordinarily expensive undertaking. And within a generation, it burnt down. Now, this is an extraordinary catastrophe because it would not be seen as, well, lightning does this, you know, you, you could take the model of what's happened at Church of Notre Dame in Paris and say, that's something brought on by the weather. There's wood in here, even with a stone ceiling, things like that can happen. No, it meant that the Virgin Mary had withdrawn her favor from the city. And if that was so, the people who lived here would resettle. If this is no longer a protected site, if there's no longer favored by any divine personage, it's not the place to be. Well, supposedly there was almost like public rioting in the square in front and you'd imagine the smoldering wound still behind and a local cleric, there was a very good school of oratory here. It was sort of haranguing the crowd to say, no, 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 you got this wrong. Uh, Mary is dissatisfied because you didn't build her church great enough. And then this is the part that's like, mm -hmm. just at that time when he is trying to persuade this reluctant public that they have simply misinterpreted the events. Um, they hear chanting from the distance it was discovered that down in the crypt under the altar was found that sacred relic, that tunic, and it was not so much as singed. That's it. Of course, that means that what Mary wanted was a church that was greater when they had what they had produced before. So the mood immediately shifted. And in a space of only a generation, which is extraordinary, most cathedrals take at least 100 years to get them completed, if they're ever completed. Uh, within a generation, they built almost all of the church that we see here. Now, it would be not only local people, but pilgrims coming here. The other relics were sent out on tour to, to gather more funds for this. Members of the aristocracy competed among themselves to make the, the grandest donations, perhaps to have a window um, dedicated in there um, with their image in there uh, <clears throat> so that the church was completed. And this is even better for showing how little there is on the ground. So just for this yellow and green and this little bit of blue. That's all that holds up the weight. Here it is from the back, from the apse. 
We'll later look at the front again too, but there's something again, characteristic of Gothic cathedrals frequently because they didn't operate from a plan that was established in advance where subsequent masons could refer to that and say, okay, we're building this part and this is the form we should follow. As the building progressed, the style changes because each part is being built in the more in whatever was contemporary. And we we'll see it better when we look from the facade, but it's kind of more dramatic here. Look at the difference in these towers. This tower was completed earlier than this one. The whole progress in Gothic architecture is for things to become lacier, lighter, more transparent. So you could follow that from almost the ground level up. Now, that part went up before this part did. And then from here on, this got done before this did. Look, even at the windows, this has more surrounds, so it's a narrower opening between it. Here, so you don't think of solid wall, there's even a little colonnette in front of it. Everything being done to dematerialize the building. This is the only part that survives from the church, uh, the pre-fire church. And then the rest is Gothic. So the wonderful interior, it's been cleaned now. See, I, I, I'm, I'm doing all in my power to persuade you to make a trip to see it. And for its vastness, this is down actually in the area around the altar, but you see, for whoever photographed this, for the people in there, there's no place you can stand and perceive the whole church. So it's always a mystery. It's beyond comprehension by the human mind, as it ought to be, since it's for the divine. Then the altar is back in here. Let's. Uh, And you see, there's an even, not even really a sense like, oh, here's the exterior and then here's the interior. Because with the buttresses, there's no straight vertical plane. That's the wall. It goes in and out. It goes in between so there can be the windows in here. And there's the flying buttresses up here. Stained glass windows, which from the exterior don't show their color you do see how very assiduous they are in removing whatever wall they can. That area is seen from within. And then the part that um, is not unique to Gothic cathedrals, but becomes quite a standard feature, and especially in French ones, is this window, which I imagine a lot of you know, is called a rose window. Uh, that's a nickname. It wasn't a name given to it originally. It's just called a wheel window, or windows like this originally. But um, they have this great circular window with stained glass within. There, the stone tracery, and then here's the view from within. Of course, the circle is one of those perfect geometric forms. Um, there are side entrances that are even more elaborate than the one on the west because they were later and they have that greater elaboration of style. So let me just show you one of their rose windows. This is something you would expect almost more to be worked in metal, wouldn't you, rather than stone? Because it, it looks so taut. 
bag stretched, something on iron maybe. And that window from within. So even windows in this area, they often have coats of arms in them, are little bullseye windows in here. Everything possible to excavate the wall. I have only one other thing to say about Gothic cathedrals. That is when you go next to Manhattan, if you go by the Cathedral of St. Patrick's, look at the side. You'll know that much as it looks like an authentic Gothic cathedral, it can't be um, because it does not have flying buttresses. And within it looks like a Gothic cathedral. So that means it's an iron structure it's because iron of course is so much stronger it can bear so much more weight for its size. Uh, so that's its cue. And now we're making a kind of a segue into the Renaissance by going back, uh, characteristic historian at work here, um, to someone else who was oh, far more important than our Abbot Suget and for far longer than in the Gothic era. And that was St. Augustine. This is an illustration from his um, writing that dominated thought for a very long time, his City of God. Um, he wrote in the beginning of the fifth century and I, really he's um, writing to counter objections by pagans um, saying that the reason that Roman uh, or, yeah, well, largely traditionalist, let's say, saying the reason Rome fell as it recently had to the Visigoths is because Christianity has weakened it. It's no longer our, the faith of the past. And Augustine is, no, that is not it. It's the other way around. Christianity has made it stronger. But then, um, so there's, there's a lot about his idea, the ideal Christian city, what it ought to be. And in that and in Augustine's other writings, he especially talks about proportion and how important proportion and number are. That, that undergirds everything in the universe and is a manifestation of the divine. Now, this idea, it goes back before Plato, but he writes about it with all the authority of being a Christian. So in Christian centuries, uh, when Plato was scarcely known in the West, um, his way of thinking about it ha uh, held greatest sway. So the universe is, is harmonious it's, and it's a harmony created by God as is wonderfully illustrated in this very, I'm, I think possibly some of you have seen this, this illustration from a Gothic early 13th century manuscript of God, the great geometer, that he is creating the universe using a compass. I know this has to be familiar to some of you. This is the cathedral in Milan. And this is our, my segue into dealing with the Renaissance era. The cathedral is, looks quite a bit like a wedding cake style here. Uh, it was started in 1386 and um, the ruler of Milan at that time, of course, wanted to impress his power and create a lasting monument for himself, um, sponsored the building of this, but he decided to, that he, he himself decided that this should not be um, the kind of traditional church for the area, which would have been built in brick. If you've been to see uh, Leonardo's Last Supper, uh, that's in another large church, which is a brick building and, and which would be more typical. So the ruler had to call on um, tradespeople, architects, anyone, anyone with skills from all over Europe to build this. So it became quite a international 
adventure. And it took several centuries to build. There was at one point in this mm, about, took a lot, it's so big, it's the second largest cathedral in Europe. Uh, it was the same story as with the cathedral in Florence. It was so big that they couldn't figure out how to roof it. I mean, they built it and then, then they stuck. Uh, <clears throat> so there was a conference of learned builders to consult about what to do. Was this building going to be sound? Should it stand? What could be done? And the minutes from their discussion survive. And there was a very heated discussion. The discussion was simply about, is this based on the right geometric form from which all else is drawn? Is it, should it be from a square? Or I think the other one, it was from a rectangle. So the argument wasn't about, this is too much weight here, this isn't here, this wall needs to be reinforced. It's like, is this the right geometry? And then the other reason for bringing this in is that one of the people who contributed ideas anyway for the lantern that's back over the crossing down here was Leonardo. So we're going to, we're inching toward him. Here's one of his drawings that we know was when he's working out his ideas for that. But we have a little more to do before. Maps often signal that. Now here you have Milan up in the north. We'll look primarily, but before that, I want to look at some work done. Um, city is not shown here, but the city of Urbino, U R B I N O, a major city in the Renaissance. And then we'll look at something from down around here, a place called Pienza. Now I'll, I'll give you that name in a minute. So we're looking at various largely central and North Italian sites. Turning first to work from Urbino. This was the Duke of Urbino in the second half of the 15th century. Uh, a man very interested in science, good government, um, a great patron. His, uh, these are famous portraits by the, an artist named Piero della Francesca in which the, the Duke, Federico and his wife are shown in profile, their, their domain extending out in the distance behind him. And he has the most striking profile. Not only are profiles are like Roman coins, that's part of the revival of classical antiquity, but he had been, um, I think he lost his other eye as well as his nose being gashed in a duel when he was younger. But he reigned from this palace in the city of Urbino. And it's quite vast. Raphael was born here. And major, major Renaissance figures at some time were here. Bramante, Leonardo, other names maybe less familiar to you. This is a room within his palace. This is the marquetry. So this is all wood. It's, it's his little studio. And it has all the um, equipment for a man of learning and, and wisdom. There's music, there's mathematics, there's views out into landscape, um, there's reading, there's science. I said, if a door ajar here, it's quite extraordinary work. And there are three paintings that survive. We don't know exactly where they were in that palace. Um, probably um, because they have these very unusual 
formats, they're, they're so low and long. Let's see, give you some typical dimensions for one. Um, 30 inches high by 86 inches long. That's this one. They're, they're probably paintings that were attached to the wall um, just about at a person's shoulder height. And they're sometimes called almost like shoulder paintings. And there are three of them. There's one, this one is in the Walters Art Gallery in, in Baltimore. Then there's one in Berlin. And then there is one in Urbino itself. And we'll look at the three of them. They are representations of the ideal city. Uh, Frederica was very, was that? I, don't, I keep using very, but he, he was an extraordinarily enlightened ruler, not only enjoying his power, but also wanting to be a good ruler, very interested in the philosophy of rule. Uh, and you can pick up that in these paintings a little bit. So when we look at this one, well, first thing I, I should tell you is that the, now the, it looks remarkably unpeopled, but the painting originally was more unpeopled than this. There were no, this, these human beings were added by some other artist. We don't know actually who the artist is that did it. This would be around the 1480s probably. But how is this for lucid, geometrical, appealing to the mind? And just redolent of mathematics, because this is all the most carefully done, absolutely scrupulously accurate mathematical linear perspective. All the lines in the um, tiled, piazza here, or even the stairs and the receding edges going back in here that all head back toward one point right there, which is the city gate. So that already has this subtext of the importance of rationality, order, peace, openness. And then what are the buildings? They recall ancient Rome. However, it's not the ancient Rome that Federico or whoever the anonymous artist could have seen, because this is a view of Rome that was done by Piranese in the 18th century, and it was still utterly unexcavated. This is the area of the forum. You can see the Colosseum right here. And it was, it was called the, the cow pasture. It was just the, the name of it, the Campo Vicino. Uh, so it was clear, I mean, everybody knew that there were some great grandeur in the vicinity, but it was subterranean still. But look at what buildings are there. It's a little bit fanciful, but that's a triumphal arch. And it vaguely recalls something like the Arch of Constantine. Now it was known that uh, in, in the 15th century that these triumphal arches were built to commemorate military victories. And the armies generally had to come in through the arch to be um, symbolically cleansed of the blood guilt of, of fighting. So what would a, why would there be this at the center? Well, three is, does have that sort of idea of the, the Trinity. So the faint whiff of something Christian there. But the ideal ruler should be an, a fine military leader. And then what's this? Well, it seems to recall the baptistry of Florence Cathedral, which in the 15th century was still believed to be um, based on a Roman temple. So the ideal ruler protects the faith. And you can recognize the Colosseum, the, even the four levels with the arches there. 
and provides for recreation for people within the city. So there's peace, security, rationality, military safety, faith, and good times. And on these columns, there are women who represent also the virtues. There's uh, justice and generosity. And I don't remember what the other two. So there are also, so there, there is a complete program of aspiration for the ideal ruler in an ideal city. And then here's another one. This one is still in Urbino. Uh, the lineup here of buildings, they look a little bit like some of the current palaces that were being built, especially in Florence. And now there's a church in the middle. And this church probably calls the one in Rome, a, a round temple, which looks so very strange because it's lost its original roofing and now just has this tile on the top. But so again, it's, a, it's an evocation. All this is to make a new world that is as great as their concept of, of an ideal Rome of the past. And, well, there's a mid 15th century palace in Florence. And then the third one here is in, in Berlin. It's a kind of damaged painting. Uh, you're looking through some portico at various temples out to the sea, ship with billowing sails and one right on the vanishing point. The coffered ceiling, oh, it's so careful, look. The sun has to be coming from over here because these don't get any light, increasing light over here. The inner side of the arch here, dark, over here, light. So this is just such a delight in precision. And natural observation sub submitted to mathematics. Now there was one city that did get built um, more or less along the lines of an ideal city. The ideal city was part of the reason it was so much a thing at this time it seems to be that, well, in the middle ages, people didn't talk about cities. Uh, they didn't have that sort of like mental construct of a city. There was a place behind walls where you went for protection, um, where you might live and then you went out into the fields to work, or if you had a business, you had your business there. But a city as an urban organization of, of all classes of people did not exist. There would be whoever the Lord was of the area maybe, but. Um, the stratified society just didn't think in terms of that. And it's only with the Renaissance that they begin to, to, there's enough of an urbanized public that they begin, even rulers, to think about what should a city be like? And one man who did was the man here, his Pope Pius II, who uh, was Pope in the very middle of the, 15th century. And he um, oversaw almost the complete rebuilding of his hometown, which it had one name, but then it's renamed for him at Pienza, P I E N Z A, which means the city of Pius. And there it is. I'll just give you a bit, there's the ground plan as it is now. And the part that was, that, that survives of his design is this design for him, 
his ideas is this section right in here. There's a plaza, just as in the three ideal cities we've seen. So cities have, uh, this is significant, there's space, there's space for leisure, for people to get together. It's not just narrow alleyways, alleys between houses. Um, there's light and space and freedom. And then that space, this gathering space, is under the watchful eye of the church. And over here is the palace that Pius had built for himself. And he encouraged the bishops. He, he built this whole, rebuilt the city. It was going to be his summer residence, getting out of Rome during the summer. He encouraged the bishops to come up here as well. And there's one bishop's palace that survives of a... <laughs> It was a good move on this man's part because he then later became Pope himself. And the town hall um, behind which is the market area. So we just look at this section. You can see in this view, uh, it does have some of that same quality that the three ideal city did. So this, clear central focus and receding to either side. Oh, we'll... Even has the form a bit like a triumphal arch. This is one of the earliest um, Renaissance facades on a, on a church. And then the Pope's palace, which looks like that palace that I, briefly showed you that's in Florence by the very most leading architect of the century. And views within. A central courtyard, redolent of antiquity in those arches, in that central space. And then in the outward facing way, there are three levels of a sort of a loggia overlooking a garden. Excuse me, Maggie. We, yeah. we lost, lost power for a couple of minutes. What, what are we looking at right now? Oh, this is the um, city of Pienza, P I E N Z A, of Siena. And it was a purpose-built center of the town for a Pope, Pope Pius II. So he actually carried through on the idea of an ideal city. Okay, thank you. And then this is looking out at the gardens, to the landscape beyond. And underneath the gardens, he had a stable for a hundred horses. So, this is a great sense for, for the Pope, or I suppose anybody, any kind of earthly ruler of just having the magnitude of the landscape beyond over which he's, he's ruling. And suitably modest on the opposite side, another Bishop's Palace. And here, the town hall which also has a tower as does the cathedral. But the cathedral tower is taller than the one on the town hall. So you get the appropriate hierarchy, the social standing of ordinary people as opposed to the, the clerics. Now we're in Milan. Great view from there. And this is a, well, actually it's a 15th century German manuscript of what Milan looked like. They knew there were mountains there, but you see it's just being presented as a kind of mm, typical Gothic jumble of houses, cheek by jowl, 
gates to get into the city because of course cities had to be protected here with a moat around it to protect it. Not any sense of particularly clear layout. Uh, protective towers with turrets. And this is a, uh, an artist's uh, reconstruction based on a 16th century map of what Milan, uh, the actual layout of Milan. That would, this is a little bit later than when Leonardo was there. And we're gonna talk about from now on about Leonardo because these fortified walls, this is a design that was really intended uh, to deal with the complete change in warfare that happened in the later part of the 15th century. That was the invention of the cannon. So they had new ways of fortifying, the sloping the walls to withstand the cannon um, and putting them at various angles so we could protect them better. But the center of the city you see is still crowded mix. Starting, you have the sense that it gradually grew. You see this circular street, so it be. Here it started, then it expands a little, expands a little, expands a little. They have a canal finally. And then they go into sort of more suburban areas and overseen altogether by the castle of the ruling family, either be the well, there are two ruling families changed in time there. So this is just about the city to which Leonardo came. Leonardo, he was a young man at this time. He was just 30 and he was working in Florence, but he, he abandoned what he was doing there, a commission that he had there, and uh, essentially sent a letter of application to um, Ludovico Sforza, the reigning ruler in Milan. Uh, his letter of application still survives and it's very interesting. It, um, there's a postscript in the, it's almost a postscript at the very end. It's like, P.S. I also paint because he talks about all the things he can do, uh, his knowledge of engineering, military engineering, cartography, um, anything doing with water. He's very interested in hydraulics, hydraulic engineering, um, something of his study of nature, uh, his interest in human anatomy. Well, anyway, Ludovico Il Moro invited him to come up and for two periods, but the first period is from 1482 to 99. That's the time while up here he does the Last Supper, um, Leonardo is working for Ludovico. That's Ludovico's palace. So Le Lud uh, Leonardo got up there and two years later, um, two, no, two to three years later, Milan was devastated by an outbreak of the bubonic plague. Um, the estimates are between a third and a half of the population died. Uh, not only was that traumatic, but the whole appearance of the city deeply grieved Leonardo who had um, an instinct for the beautiful. He liked beautiful things around him at all times. And the city to him was ugly. There, there was no provision for any sanitation at all. There was no running water, no, no way of re, uh, removing sewage. The streets were narrow. It was just like a small medieval village that had grown and grown and grown. So Leonardo, who was always interested in architecture, although nothing he uh, worked on ever was built in, in um, completely. He, he did a lot of speculative work 
on what would be an ideal city. And he wanted to sort of convince Ludovico to build this new city that would be hygienic, beautiful, peaceful, the ideal place. Just, I'm, I will have some drawings of this. They're difficult to look at because they're scattered throughout all of his um, notebooks. The, um, there's a codex in particular, it's called Codex Atlanticus of over a thousand pages. Leonardo in his own lifetime was not at all systematic about doing his drawings as you might guess in this, because this page has a head, a life drawing for one of the figures who's in the Last Supper. And then down here, this is, seems to be his idea for a revision in the towers of the um, castle, the fortress castle for Ludovico. So his pages are just, there's stuff all over the place. This is one he did even before he came there, showing his interest in water, a uh, way of changing water levels, pulleys, water wheels, as I said, very interested in hydraulics. So he's just spilling out ideas. So through models and through a few drawings, I can suggest what his ideas were for the ideal, ideal city. His ideas largely got shelved for centuries, um, but now they're um, drawing a lot of attention again. For one thing, I, I don't have anything to show you this, but he said, Milan needs to be smaller. It's too large. So he wanted to reduce the size of the city and build 10 satellite cities. You could think of that as an early version of the suburbs. And they would follow a single plan as well. Now, what is this ideal city to have? First thing, <laughs> this paper model, shows you, it's to be built on three levels. There's a top level, let's see if I can give you something else that shows this, yeah. The top level where there's pedestrian traffic only, and this is where the gentry, the aristocracy live. The houses that are built, mm, are of a uniform height in just some area. And then there's variety. Whereas uh, that was, um, well, even thinking to like 19th century industrial towns, It'd be just the same, same level all the way along. So he, he wanted some variety there. But more than the height of the buildings, what matters is their spacing. The streets, have to be as wide across as the buildings are high, at least, so that there's always sunlight that reaches to the street and buildings across the street will get light as well. This is something that early skyscrapers in New York were built before they were realizing that they were just creating caverns of darkness. That's why in Manhattan you have that, well, now we have, plazas in front, but you have that setback sort of wedding cake, you know, you go up a couple levels, you recede a little, you go a little higher, recede a little more. That's to make sure that there's going to be light that gets down to the streets. So Leonardo has thought of that. And the other reason he wanted the streets to be wide was so that if there's an earthquake, if one building falls, it doesn't fall onto another. So he's not thinking in terms of this is the rational universe, the mathematical, or, and believe me, he, he thoroughly subscribed to the thought that the world is based on, on measure and the beauty of measure. But he's thinking in a far more radical, pragmatic way when he's thinking of his ideal city. And these cities also would have staircases on the exterior, not so you could go up and often he would have staircases. Here's a funny one. And then I'll tell you a little more and we'll come back to it again, but a funny one. 
He wanted spiral staircases so that men couldn't stand in the corner and pee. So he's thinking even at that level of hygiene. So people, there, so there are wide plazas where people could gather, there could be festivities, there could be public meetings. Um, there are arcades so they could walk if it rains. Um, there's light and space. And then there's a level below where tradespeople would be and their shops would be. <laughs> and then below that, there's a third level. And that's where there would be water. You can adjust the level of this. See, there's a lock you could have. You could adjust the level so could people be up here and they could, they could go down here. So at this time, still um, pre-modern vehicular traffic, the easiest uh, form of transport was by water. So you would have goods and trade ferried around town, nothing like trucks, um, on these canals and the canals could clean the city. All waste would be carried out by canals down below. So it's from the life of somewhat luxurious level to trades level to the most um, animal level down below. And water is very important for making it possible. Well, think of us with our sewage system, our underground water systems. There weren't things like that at the time. And here's another model made of his city. Oh, oh I'll show you just one of his drawings in the nice seat. It is time to stop. Let's get just one of the buildings. He, you know, Leonardo loved horses. This is his stables. The hay, the fodder is kept up above. It's pushed over to the side. It comes down the walls to the horses which are fed here. The horses are tied up so that when they make a mess, it slopes down here, goes down below and goes into the water. So he has a complete system that he thinks through. Uh, we'll look at some more bits of his drawings next time. And then the modern utopian thinkers who don't have that kind of practicality that, that Leonardo did when we look at Corbu and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. So do you have anything you want to look at again? Before I say goodbye, or when Leonardo, questions? Maggie, oh. yeah, go ahead. You have a question. When Leonardo came to Milan, where did he come from? Oh, uh, Florence. Florence oh. is his home. Thank you, mm -hmm. Maggie. Um, Joy here. Yeah. Uh, have you? Did you ever visit the inside of the Sforza? No. Oh, I did some years ago, and they have a magnificent Leonardo museum in there with um, drawings of all of his inventions and some small models, I mean, small desktop size models of some of his inventions. I was blown away. I, I just I went in there uh, knowing a little bit about what to expect, but not anything. It was way beyond what I could have ever imagined. It was magnificent. I wound up spending about two hours in there just inhaling all of the magnificent yeah, it, work and the model of and drawings of a dredge that he, that he thunk up. And, uh, he even invented a street cleaning machine. I mean, he's just like... It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. So you could see why painting to him was, um, yeah, that's not as important as science. Um, and it is in Milan that they have the library with this big thousand page collection of his drawings of anything dealing with science and engineering. So, yeah.
there's a museum in Milan also, which um, has all kinds of models that were built after his designs. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, Maggie, about yeah. this sewage that you mentioned, the horses. Yeah. Is that the same water they drank from? No. Oh, no, no, no. He, he had everything so planned out. He even uh, figured that for the canals that you had to, um, they needed to be cleaned once a year. You had to get, you had to make sure the water kept flowing. So there's no stagnant, stenchful water. And you needed to clean out all the sedimentation that would be on the bottom. Uh, so he figured out how you were going to do that. He thought of everything. Maggie, did anybody follow through on any ideas of this city? No, they are now. Now, now, no, I mean, uh, urban planners. How long did it take? Are, well, yeah, a few centuries, right? Now, wow. ur urban planners are are looking at it. Part of the 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 challenge, of course, is that these are just little scattered drawings, you know, on the corner of this page and the corner of this page, and this and this is ideas keep coming to them, but. Um, Maggie, this is Pat. I just have a bit of trivia about um, the Duke of Urbino. Yeah. I was looking up to see what his last name was, and it said he was the first rhinoplasty. And <laughs> he, he lost his right eye in a jousting accident yeah. by Lance. Yeah. He had a portion of his nose removed so right. he could see better from his left eye. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's part of this kind of like incredibly novel, scientific, rational way of looking, isn't it? It's like, well, how can we deal with this practically? Right. Yes. How can I solve this? Right. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> that's a hard one to top, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll see you next week then. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Thank you, Bye. Thank you Maggie.